first day that I started work at the pit, on that Monday, I came home and there was a film on it on the telly in the afternoon because back in those days it was the days before loose women and uh, bargain hunt and things like that and I've been up since half past five and <laughs> didn't usually get up at that time before so I was kind of jiggered so I was laid out on the settee and the film, the, the Monday afternoon film was called The Brave Don't Cry and it was about the Knox Shinnock Castle Colliery disaster back in the 1950s where the pit had worked too close to the surface and water had, had gone into the pit, killed some but trapped an awful lot of the miners and the film is all about the, uh, about, about the rescue. You must try and watch it, it's a fantastic film. So what's that got to do with this? But when I moved here in the 1990s, we used to come through to Carlisle two or three times a week and used to pass this. And at first I thought it was just a war memorial. Well, not just a war memorial, but the local war memorial. But then I learned when I started researching the collieries that it wasn't, it was to do with the mining. It was a memorial to the miners and two men in particular who had given their lives. And the, the interesting thing is, the disaster that this commemorates occurred in 1908 and was very similar to the Notchinock Castle disaster. And at times I've often wondered whether legislation had been introduced following this disaster that perhaps the Notchinock disaster may not have happened. I'm not saying that's the case, it's just an idea I have. Because I know when I started at Grime Bridge and you used to look at the colliery plans, we went in quite a long way before we actually started working coal. We had to get in at least, I think there had to be at least 60 foot of cover above us. I think it was 60 foot and that was to do with the Noxianic disaster. But anyway, I suppose that's irrelevant. What I'm going to do now, well we're going to tell you a story. A, a true account, a moving account, all about why this memorial is here. The inscription on the other side says, Greater love hath no man than he that lays down his life for his fellow man. And obviously that's taken from the scriptures talking about Jesus Christ. But in this instance, it's talking about the two men that's mentioned on this side of the, the, platform, the, uh, the, the monument. Robert Pattison, now he was the, old, the deputy, and Matthew Hilliard, who was the back overman, he was the senior man underground at the time. And they died trying to save a young hewer called James William Wharton. And that happened on the 28th of January, 1908. So what happened on that fateful day? Well, it'd be really easy just to do, just to tell you the whole story in one video, but I've spent 30 years or more researching this coal field and obviously this disaster has been very prominent in it. So in the first video, we're going to talk all about the coal field, its birth. Who were the coal owners? What was the geology? And how did the Roachburn Colliery come to life? In the following video, we're going to really delve into this particular sentiment. Greater love hath no man. So what is it about the human spirit that brings that scripture to life? What is it in some men and women that, or maybe in all of us, that when the time comes, we stand up to be counted and uh, do things that we wouldn't perhaps ordinarily do? And that's what we're going to look at in Matthew and Robert. We're going to have a look at, well, certainly with Matthew, we're going to have a look at his background, what may have put those things within him. We're going to look at the colliery itself, Roachburn and the disaster and the aftermath to it. So let's make a start now and let's have a look at some of the coal owners, who they were and how this coal field really developed. So our history is going to start way, way back in the year 
9.27. Actually, we're going to go right back to the 12th of July, 9.27. Why? Because I think it's good to do so. What happened then in 9.27? Well, the king was Athelstan, and what he was doing was trying to unite his kingdom. In other words, stop all the other kings round about from supporting pagan kings, specifically the Vikings. And that is what happened very closely here at Penrith in the year 927, at Emont Bridge. Now historians are a little bit, they're not 100% uh, sure on the exact locations of things in Emont Bridge. But basically Athelstan, remember, was a Christian and they gathered with a lot, a lot of men, different kings from round about. And some historians think that they could possibly have gathered at one of the henges in Penrith, maybe Maybra Henge, or perhaps King Arthur's Henge, what is now called King Arthur's Round Table. It's nothing to do with King Arthur. And there was also a third henge, which has now more or less disappeared. In fact, most of King Arthur's Round Table has disappeared under the village. Historians aren't 100% sure mind and they think perhaps it could have even been at Burham Castle. But anyway, they met there uh, at near Emont Bridge. And possibly they met just a couple of mile away, again another theory of historians, in a monastery that the Venerable Bede mentions. And where was that monastery? Yes, it was in the village of Dacre. And that is the name that we are after taking hold of now, Dacre, for where the, uh, the local collieries actually who they belong to. Now, the monastery, it's not there anymore, but there's a church there. And that is the thing, the thought is that the, mon that the church today was built on the monastery. And it's one line of reasoning is that Athelstan went there maybe afterwards to, uh, because it was a Christian place. But also the signing could have been there. Anyway, let's get back to the Dacre family. So who were the Dacres? Well, from the research I've done, they were from obscure sort of beginnings, but an extremely ambitious family up here in the borders. And they took the name from the village and the stream that I've talked about. Uh, and they became known, or they called themselves the D Dacres, the D Dacres. And that's your Norman connection. Most of the families up here were de something like the, the de Blenkinsops. And they got granted lands specifically along the marches. And the, the idea was, because they were granted the lands, as with the other sort of landowners, the remit basically was to keep the Scots out and defend the king's interests. And that's what they did. And like I said, we're talking here because Naworth Castle is uh, it's, it's not the best place to film. It's a bit intrusive. So this is part of the land. And I think it looks the part as well. We're in Kirkoswald, or KO as we locals kind of call it, because we can't be bothered to say Kirkoswald. KO, Kirkoswald is the Church of St Oswald, and the Dacres ended up with this land. Eventually, the family was split up into two halves. There was the Dacres of the North and the Dacres of the South. And obviously, this land was taken by the Dacres of the North. There was already a castle here, as you can see and that was originally possibly a manor house and it was fortified around about the year 1201 and it became the seat of the Dacres obviously it's built as much of this is in beautiful Penrith sandstone and this stayed in the Dacre hands until well Thomas Dacre kind of lost it for treason he got all his lands taken off him as we will sort of learn and the castle then came into the hands of the Howards and it was basically abandoned and William Howard emptied it basically I think he took a lot of his stuff across to Naworth and the castle became nothing more than a quarry for use for, for other things as you can see there's not an awful lot of it left but what the Dacres also did is the church here in K.O. they made it collegiate in other words they made it a college for clerics uh, and about 12 clerics were sort of installed in that theological, well, theological seat of learning. But obviously that came to an end when Henry got rid of the monasteries, didn't it? But it's still there. And these lands then around K.O. eventually came into the hands of the Feathersonhoffs. Again, in our local mining history, the Feathersonhoffs are really interesting. But let's learn a little bit more about the Dacres uh, and how they went on with the local mining and, uh, and how they basically died out.
By the mid 1500s, the Dacre family had more or less died out, or the male heirs had. There was only one male heir left, and that was a young lad by the name of George, and he had sisters. Now, he'd been made a ward by Thomas, let me get this right, the fourth Earl of Norfolk. He had taken him in, obviously they weren't living up here, they were living down south. He had taken him in, and to strengthen his family, he had married three of his sons to the three Dacre daughters. Now then, young George had a little bit of an accident with a wooden vaulting horse or a rocking horse. Most sources say a vaulting horse. He had an accident with that, which led to his death. So, those lands then passed into the hand of the girls. But of course they couldn't, couldn't inherit that land the same, could they? So it passed to their husbands, the Howards. Hmm, interesting. So who were the Howards? Well, even though this is a, a small provincial coal field, what we're talking about in the Gilsland Barony, believe it or not, the people who owned the land were right at the cutting edge of power. Yeah, as we've, we're going to talk about people who had an awful lot, they had nearly everything and yet wanted more. And the end of our story is going to be with people who had nothing but gave their all. Now right at the top of the tree there, we've mentioned the Duke of Norfolk. Um, uh, the fourth Duke of Norfolk was Thomas. And he basically was, he was first cousin to Queen Elizabeth I. One of the most wealthiest, powerful men in the country, probably just next to the Queen in power. Now, his father, the third Duke of Norfolk, well, a cousin of his, Catherine, Catherine Howard, well, she became the fifth wife of Henry VIII. That didn't turn out well. So you can see where the Howards are when it comes to power. They were even cousins, I believe, to Anne Boleyn. Now, as we know, these were really turbulent times, weren't they? Power struggles. I'm, I'm not really a, a royal sort of historian. You need to talk to David Starkey about this, and yet, when he does talk about this subject, there's one important thing he leaves out, and we've got Mark Hatton, who's a Lakeland mining historian, to, to thank for this, the research he's done, and for putting this piece of information into the key of the history. Now, the Northern Earls weren't that happy with Queen Elizabeth for a few reasons. First, Elizabeth had brought back Protestantism. Sorry, Protestantism. I can't say it. She was C of E. All right. And most of those were Catholics. Now, the Earl of Northumberland, the seventh Earl, I think it was the seventh, there's so many numbers of them, isn't it? Anyway, he was called Thomas. And I can't think, but think of him when we when I do this and think of him, of Blackadder, the first series, and uh, Millard Percy, you know, that's him, the Earl of Northumberland. <laughs> it wasn't really like that, obviously. And he wrote up, like I said, they wanted to restore Catholicism and Mary Queen of Scots was going to be a big player. She was going to be their hero. And Thomas Howard, the Duke of Northumberland, uh, the Duke of Norfolk, our sort of alter hero, if you will, who inherits these lands, he was going to marry Mary Queen of Scots. That was part of the plan. But anyway, back to Northumberland. He, Elizabeth had granted him lands in Keswick because of, I forget what he'd done, whether he'd been part of a battle, but anyway, he'd shown himself faithful and she'd grant him the, in, in these lands in Keswick. Now then, they needed copper. They needed copper badly. Henry VIII had let the kingdom go and Elizabeth, she did try and restore things uh, and make it a good kingdom again, wealthy kingdom, because she knew that she was going to have some military battles to deal with. And copper was so important. Uh, and they knew there was copper in the country, but nobody really had the skills to mine it. So what Elizabeth did, she sent abroad to Germany to bring in miners from over there, experienced miners, not just experienced in mining, but also experienced in smelting the ore. And when they came across, they identified Keswick in the Lake District as one of the most ideal locations that they were going to find copper. And they did. They found it up the Newlands Valley. They, they mined the copper and 
the, the built a smelter near Keswick. It's a fantastic, fantastic history, and Mark has really looked into this. Have a look at some of his talks. Ian Tyler's written about it as well in his book. But anyway, if if the Duke of Northumberland, sorry, the Earl of Northumberland, owned the land in Keswick, surely he owned the mineral rights for the copper. Oh no, no, no. Queen Elizabeth decided those rich minerals were hers, even though she'd given the land. She kind of, well, I want that back. That angered him more. So now you see what we've got. We've got power, money, religion, a real unholy trinity. And that was part and parcel as much as the religion that fueled the rising of the North. Well, I'm not really gonna go in that deep to the rising of the North. But anyway, it all kicked off in Durham at the cathedral we were breaking in there. Uh, and it didn't go well. They were, they were kind of losing. But Thomas, the Duke of Norfolk there, Thomas Howard, he, he wasn't as enthusiastic. He, he, could see, he could see the different things that were going on. He did still want to marry Mary, and he obviously did want, <laughs> he, he wanted prominence. But the rising of the North came to nothing, and uh, Thomas Howard ended up in the Tower of London. But he pleaded to the Queen, who really, she had a soft spot for him and he, he was sort of released because of a lack of evidence but also he, he actually beg, begged for mercy and said he really did want to marry Mary uh, and they decided he hadn't been that treasonous after all so he was kind of released but the Duke of Northumberland wasn't <laughs> as lucky he did he, even though he escaped for a short while he was returned uh, and executed I think he was hung drawn and quartered and, and what have you don't quote me, but anyway, he was certainly done away with. But sadly for Thomas Howard, he, get him, he got involved in a further plot against Queen Elizabeth. And this time, he wasn't as lucky. He was arrested, put in the tower, uh, and he was sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered. But Queen Elizabeth was really, she had a soft heart, and his sentence was commuted to just mere beheading the lenient in those days you kind of wonder as well don't you what it must have meant to young thomas howard there young william howard sorry his son who was now with the dacres with, with, with the dacre daughter and he, he kind of got given the lands they granted the lands up here what must it be like with your dad getting beheaded like that it must have a great effect on you psychologically who knows i mean they were different times weren't they they were living a so totally different life to what you and I sort of live. Well, that wasn't the end of the story because there was other Dacres who thought that they should have the, the, the lands up here. Leonard Dacre was the second son of the third Baron. And he said that the lands should pass to a male heir, not to his nieces. And so, now Leonard had also played a part in the rebellion of the North, but he played it canny as well. He'd sort of been on both sides and as he could see the rebellion going sideways, he'd gone down and pledged his allegiance to Queen Elizabeth I. Then he seized Greystoke Castle and he seized Nowarth Castle and he fortified Nowarth even more, brought in artillery. So many of the, local, the locals in charge, the, 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 the lieutenants of the marches and Queen Elizabeth herself thought, yeah, this guy needs watching and they didn't really trust him. So a court was convened at Greenwich and that court found that the, Lord, the, the, the title of Lord Dacre of the North had come to an end, it had died and Leonard Dacre's um, challenge to the title was null and void. So there he was in Naworth Castle with cannons at his disposal and quite a large troop. He was very popular with the locals, the locals didn't really like William Howard and the way he did things so they flocked around Leonard Dacre and in fact he ended up with a force around about 3,000 strong and that's when it really did kick off and trouble really did hit the fan let's go across and see what happened on the 20th of January of uh, 1570 Lord Henry Scroop Henry Luscroop he was the ninth Baron of Bolton. He received orders that he should go and apprehend Dacre. Now 
the scoop was under, knew full well how fortified Nowarth Castle was and he didn't fancy the job of taking Dacre there. So what he did, he suggested that Lord Dacre should come across to Carlisle and perhaps discuss the state of the country because he'd be really interested in his advice. Dacre wasn't having none of that. He wasn't that silly. He knew what was happening. So Dacre replied that he, his health wasn't at, at the best at that present time and he, he couldn't really come out. But if Scroop wanted to come to Naworth with some of his men, they could dine there that evening. And not only that, he would gladly give what humble opinions he could about the state of the country. Come into my parlour, said the spider to the fly. By the 15th of February, they were no closer arresting Dacre, and word was sent to Queen Elizabeth's cousin, Henry Carey, who was Lord Hunson. Now he was up in Berwick, and he was ordered to go to Naworth and to take Dacre. On the 20th of February at dawn, Hunsdon turned up at Naworth Castle along with the, the Warden of the Middle Marches, Sir John Forster. Now Henry Carey, Lord Hunsdon, certainly nobody's fool, and he quickly assessed the situation there on the morning of the 20th of February there, in the early dawn light. But Naworth was not for the taking there, it would take a siege to take it, and he wasn't prepared to do that at the time. So him and Forster set off then to Carlisle, and their idea was to meet up with Scroop and his forces. Inside Naworth Castle was Dacre and his forces of perhaps going on for 3,000 people. Okay, not regular soldiers, many of them, but they were locals. They, their passions were up. This was a home match for them. They were fighting for what they believed in and to preserve what they wanted to preserve. This was going to be no easy battle. Now, Dacre as Hunsdon left, him and his forces came out of the castle he followed Hunsdon and Forster on the road to Carlisle. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, four miles out of Naworth on the way to Carlisle, you meet the River Gelt. And that is an obstacle, obviously. So they, they cross the Gelt. And that is why the battle is sometimes known as the Battle of Gelt Bridge. But was it a bridge? Was it a fort? The exact location seems to be um, elusive these days. Anyway, as they got there, Dacre saw his chances and his ragtag army actually charged Hunson's cavalry. Believe it or not, Hunson was later to say in a letter to the Queen that it was the bravest thing he had ever witnessed, the bravest, bravest army, if you will, the bravest force to ever attack his shot. That's exactly what he said. Now bearing in mind Dacre's army mostly, a lot of them were tenants. They wouldn't have had proper weapons. Perhaps they had things that they'd liberated at Durham from the Loyalist troops. Who knows? But for most people it would be a case of anything heavy, anything sharp, or a combination of both. Axes, bill hooks, hedging shears, Maces maybe with the sharp edges, anything, pikes certainly. And they attacked Hunson's cavalry. The hand-to-hand -hand fighting would have been horrific and devastating. But obviously Hunson saw the, the, the bravery of those people that attacked him. But that attack was repelled. And then the tide was turned because Hunson then sent in his cavalry. And the cavalry well, it just decimated Dacre's forces. Three or four hundred of Dacre's men lay dead, and another two or three hundred were taken prisoner. Dacre's day was over, and he fled towards Lidsdale uh, with other people in hot pursuit of him, but he got away, then eventually to Flanders, while the very flower of the Gilsland barony lay by the Gelt and leeching the blood into it. Who knows? Maybe some of those were some of the early miners of the Gilsland barony, we don't know. But they gave their all for the masters and were left here. It is said that the river ran red for days, who knows. A terrible occurrence that happened here nearly 500 years ago. This is actually the confluence of the Hellbeck and the, the River Gelt. And in some places you'll see the battle 
uh, described as the Battle of Hellbeck. But we don't know, we can't say where it exactly was for sure, or nobody will tell me where it was for sure, but there are a few ideas. As we speak at present, there is no memorial to the battle or to those who fell, even if anybody knows any of the names to those that fell and give their lives here. It's just, they've just disappeared into history. Now I know somebody's doing some in-depth research into this and they're going to publish a book on it uh, and maybe they've uncovered some names. It's sad when people just disappear off into history without a trace um, after giving so much. But there we go, that, what can happen to all of us? Well as you can see Geltwoods is an absolutely fantastic place and behind me you've got this wonderful outcrop of red sandstone and believe it or not these were used as Roman quarries when they built the Roman wall. Yeah, fantastic isn't it? Although a lot of the Carlisle end of the wall was actually turf uh, and the bits that were stone you can't see anymore. It's been reused, recycling. What did the Romans do for us eh? And if you look carefully in places you can actually see chisel marks, you can see quite a lot of chisel marks and believe it or not in a couple of places though they're inaccessible now for the normal mere mortals like myself there's actual Roman graffiti yeah isn't that fantastic now as you've seen this isn't the place for a cavalry charge is it it's too pent up and we also said some people call it the Battle of Hellbeck where we've just been so I asked a couple of the historians what their opinion was, because like I said, I'm not a military strategist at all, one way <laughs> at all. Uh, and one of them came back to me with some quite interesting theories. Well, one quite interesting theory actually. So what we're going to do, we're going to go and have a look at where it is quite possible, not saying it actually did, but a possible location for where the two forces met as they crossed the River Gelt. Come on, let's go and have a look. So we're coming across the footbridge now that Gelt on the River Gelt. Um, and one, one local guy there, really kind, he gives an idea where the ford was. So we'll see if we can see where the ford was, where the river crossing, which uh, I've been told is where is quite likely that the uh, not that the battle took place, but where they met up with each other. And there is I say I'm not a military historian at all. But anyway, let's see if we can find the ford. It is on the first ordnance survey map. We'll look in. Looking back across towards the uh, where Gelt Mill is, you can see where the little brook comes behind the uh, the mill. So the river crossing would have been round about here. It's altered a little bit, apparently. They built bankings up to stop the flooding. Well, this is more or less where uh, they would have hit the Gelt. This is as good a place as any. Obviously it's altered on the other side where it's been built up. Actually you can see where the bridge is as well. I mean that's really a good, a good place for a ford isn't it? Whether that bridge is in the same location as back when the first ordnance survey maps done, I don't know. But we're in the we're in the the general vicinity, uh, and according to the historian, who is a very re very reliable historian, this was an established crossing for centuries. So it's quite likely, in his opinion, worthy opinion as well, that it was round about here. So that was the end of the Dacres. Now there's another coal owner we want to look at before we get into the Howards. who were the stuff of myth and legend any old coal workings and it was them that was in there. So let's now go and have a look at uh, who these other coal owners supposedly were, who their tenure finished just before the, the, the end of the Dacres, but their, their history is tied up together. And one of the owners has always allegedly been the monks, right? When I say the owners, the monks are credited with doing an awful lot of work in the Coal coalfield. You ask anybody, look in a lot of the old books, the monks, and old folklore as well. Any old workings that were found, ah, the monks have been in. What had they? Was it just folklore? Was it more than folklore? Did the monks of Lanarkost actually work the coal commercially? Did they work it at all? Well, let's try and explore it a little bit. We're here at 
at Lanacost under the old Abbey Bridge uh, and as we wander up to the Priory let's ask a few questions and ponder on that subject. So all of this as we know goes back to the Norman Conquest. Well it goes back further but our sort of story and this land sort of became yet yeah, Duke Bill's sort of cohorts got a hold of this land around about 1157. Don't forget they didn't get this far north for a start. And they had all that harrying of the north, didn't they? You know, where they slaughtered thousands and starved them to death. Now, as a reward for his loyal servants and the servants of his heirs, he granted lands. And all along here, as you know, it's like the Scottish border. And he granted them great lands up here, but it was also, it was a gift, but they also had a price to pay. They had to guard this place from Scottish invaders. They didn't have an easy time of it. So this was known as the debatable lands on the borders and, and the land along it, the different parts were called the marches. And those in charge were the wardens of the march. This is just a potted history. I am no expert on it at all. So the guy that was granted this land originally was Robert DeVoe, or Vox. Uh, yeah, uh, and he was granted this land. And what did he do? What most of them do, they gave the thanks to God for all the slaughtering, and they built a priory. And we're here at Lanacost, where the priory is, where the fabled monks of Nowarth coal mining fame were based. Let's have a look. So here we have the priory behind us. It's a priory. And basically, it was housed by canons. They were, they were clerics, um, they, were, they were there to do ecclesiastical stuff, they'd pray up to seven times a day and to look after the local population, to, to kind deeds, ecclesiastical deeds to them. So they certainly had no time for mining coal. They were clerics, they weren't manual labourers. Now, in 1296, as I said, this is on the Middle Marches, on the debatable lands, the Scottish border, that was open to border raids, the border reavers, which is a massive subject and really, really interesting. Get into that subject, visit the, uh, the jail at Hexham, the museum there, it's fantastic. But in 1296, the Scots invaded again and targeted the Priory, and it was William Wallace, of all people, yeah, Braveheart, and they left a mess, to say the least. And then, in 1306, it was Edward I, uh, the King of England, who was on his sort of crusade uh, to get the Scots back into line. Now, he wasn't having a great deal of luck, really, because uh, he got ill. And he'd gone all the way across to Newcastle, apparently, um, and he, he was too ill to engage the Scots, but he'd followed on behind them, sort of keeping tabs on them, if you will. But in Newcastle, he got that ill that they brought him all the way back. The idea was to bring him to Carlisle to set up um, like a parliament, a court there, you know. But they, they brought him back on a litter. He, he couldn't ride or anything. And they stopped here at Lanacost to rest because the journey was killing him, basically. And he um, kind of stayed, that was in September, and he stayed for about the next five months along with a 200 plus entourage. Now, this was a very poor priory. So it really drained the resources. Uh, and I dare say the cannons were really glad the following March when Edward was cannily on his way again. In 1311, it was the turn of Robert Bruce. He then came and again did great vandalism, sacked the place, destroyed, yeah, really destroyed the place, causing untold damage. Again, that really ate into the coffers for all the repair work. In 1346, it was sieged again <laughs> and vandalised, this time by King David of Scotland and his army. They ravaged the place and it is said by one chronicler that uh, a great deal of expense had to be done to repair the buildings. So, whatever lands they owned weren't bringing in a great deal of money. Let's think of the coal mines. By 1379, there was only four cannons here and one or two other people, maybe more than one or two others, that did the day-to-day -day duties. And the place was more or less bankrupt. It is said that it was in a state, it was nearly, in a, the cannons were nearly in a state of dire want. That's how bad the situation was here. 
The rescue came, but certainly not straight away. It was in the 1400s when Thomas Dacre, yeah, Thomas Dacre, he got married and he married a Greystoke. Was it Elizabeth Greystoke? And in doing so, he inherited a lot of her land. Well, he inherited all her lands. So he became very rich and he bestowed some of those riches upon the priory and kind of pulled them out of the mire for the time being. But they didn't reckon on Henry VIII, did they? So 1537 and Henry was the first, well, he wasn't prime minister, but he was the first monarch with a round of pit closures in that he, uh, he, was, clo he was taking all the property off, off the priories. Now, we can't say the priory owned any collieries, can we yet? We haven't got to that stage. But anyway, Henry tended to pick on the smallest priories first, and this was one of them. So this was dissolved, and at that time, there was only seven cannons here altogether. And it was sort of only had an income of about 80 pound a year. So th there wasn't a great deal to be got for, it, from, for Henry for this, apart from the lands. And the lands were important because he divided them up later on. Now then, the Dacres, as we've said, were always involved with with the kings of England uh, on their campaigns and the kings rewarded them and Henry rewarded Thomas Dacre by granting him the priory here which he turned into his own Desres. Part of it is still there that I've had a look at today. So bearing all that in mind then, what can we look at with coal ownership and all the folklore that the monks were mining all the coal in this area uh, right back in the ancient of days. Is there any truth in it? What can we find out? So the question we asked then, did the monks of Lanacost work the coal? Did they actually mine it? Well, they were clerics, so they themselves certainly would not be mining the coal. But that doesn't mean to say that they didn't have anything to do with it, because they obviously did visit all the old, um, the old folklore about it. And it's most likely that they had other people mining the coal and they benefited from it. Now we have an insight uh, from the 1240s, round about the in, on the Coal Fell area, which again is a place where the, the monks worked, the monks were in. That's the problem. Every old working that was encountered, the monks were in. The monks were there. They mined the coal. And that just isn't the case. Now, back in 1240, Walterus de Wind granted lands, his lands here, between Temple Garth and Clausgill Beck, to the, to the canons of Lanacost Priory. But he reserved the rights to carry on farming and to lead away coals. That's going back to 1240. So if he's reserving the right to lead coals away, coal mining is obviously going on on the coal fell at that time. And it wasn't the cannons that were doing it. And we know that this area became part of where the, uh, the Dacres were actually mining as part of the estate. It wasn't the cannons. Now we have this fantastic stone here that's inscribed and I wish this stone was somewhere else it's just basically to stop folk driving on the grass and it has been hit a few times but it's inscribed. Now it's in the back of my mind that a few years ago you could read this. In fact people who really knew what they were doing would still be able to read the inscription but as far as memory serves it is supposed to have a mention of Wingate's colliery. Now certainly Wingate or Wingate, Yat being the old name for gate is, is inscribed on the stone. And isn't it interesting, that guy, Walterus de Wind, you've got the Norman connection with the name de Wind, but this area is known as Wingate's Walter de Wind. Uh, and this became known as Wingate's Colliery, or the Coal Fell Colliery. And the other side of the Coal Fell Beck, in the field there, that area is called Temple Garth. Again, with its own fascinating history. Let's get more into the uh, Coal Fell Colliery and how the Dacres were working it. Now Temple Garth has a really interesting history which runs right through coal mining as well. Local historians are a little bit divided on where it gets its name from. It certainly is a very old building. Now, some say that it has to do with the Knights Templar and others suggest that perhaps there was a Roman effigy found nearby and it kind of found a home there, viz Temple. Whatever its history, I'm more interested in its coal mining history. Now the Dacres, we know that this area around the coal fell, we've got at least 500 years of documentation. Not a long list, but enough to put a pattern through. And in 1485, 
there was a royal examination of uh, Humphrey Dacre's estates and it said that his coal mines on Tyndall Fell, uh, this would have been Tyndall Fell at the time, they'd been rendered valueless because of the, the Scots and the threat of invasion and the repeated reaving that was going on. Now I haven't time to go into that an awful lot this time because we've, we've, we've dealt with the gelt, dealt with the gelt, <laughs> with that battle so we'll leave it at that. But th those Scots and the, and the border reavers which went both ways, the English went up into Scotland, they were vicious, they, they set fire to villages and towns, murder was commonplace, it, it, it was hard work and that would have had a big effect on the local industry. And if we fast forward through history to 1562, the well-known dispute between William Dacre from Naworth and Thomas Dacre from Lanacost, where we've just been. Uh, and that dispute sort of brought a cessation of coal being worked upon Tyndall Fell. So we've got a long, long history right through. Uh, and let's get back to the monks. This road that I'm stood on here, this was the main highway if you were traveling to Alston from well, from Old Bankgate, from Brampton, this was the main road, now just a, a bridleway. But this, this obviously would have been used to transport a lot of coal, and if we go across here, we get to Midjome and lands that were held by Lanacost Priory. Not exactly in Midjome themselves, but down by there and along Hartley Burn. And that's interesting, because they probably did work coal on their own lands. And when the Howards took over, working the estate and owning the estate, well, William Howard belted Will in the 1600s. There's written records of him being in the Craig Nuke Call up at Midjome. And I'm wondering whether he, he carried on an established working area, whether that's where Lanacross Priory had been working on their lands and he just carried on. Now, it's interesting what William Howard did not him personally, but the estate, because they weren't just working coal, they were invested in research and development. There's at least two instances of boring rods being talked about. First, buying boring rods, and that equated to nearly a thousand pounds a day, but also of people transporting the boring rods and being paid for doing that, and even taking them down to the Forest of Dean. So mining on the estate was certainly established in the 1200s and belted will. Well, I wonder about that because we've talked about the Battle of Gelt and how they went on with William Howard mining coal. As we know, the tenants were involved with the, the dispute between the Dacres losing the land and the Howards taking over and everything that went on then. Well, what sort of feeling was left? A whole, it would have took at least a generation, perhaps even two generations, for that bad feeling to disappear, you'd think. Um, we sort of like finished talking about that period after the battle, but it must have gone on. Were, were the reprisals by the new uh, owners of the estate? W what was the bad feeling like? I mean, even think of disputes today, the minor strike. People are going to take that to the grave. So it it's an, it would be an interesting subject if we could find out more about that time period and socially what the estate was like, the barony was like following that big dispute. But then we were talking about the pits up at Lanacost, weren't we? Uh, and William Howard. Now William Howard, obviously, he, there was again a threat of Scots invasion coming upon, upon Naworth Castle around about 1640, by which time he was in bad health. And he disappeared to Greystoke. He hightailed it out of it to Greystoke Castle. Um, he, and that's where he died. And, and that's where we lose a bit of a history on the mining because those household books of Belted Will, they keep a lot of records and Graham Brooks is kind of going through all that now. watching this first episode I don't know we've gone on about all sorts of things that perhaps aren't to do with mining but it's to give you a background of what shaped this coal field there's some fantastic historians working up here working together local enthusiasts freely share information uh, and, and enjoy doing what we're doing so thanks for watching don't forget to leave a comment if you want to you want to ask a question or just generally say hello and don't forget to like subscribe and share. See you later.